Have you ever wondered why some cornea start to thin and bulge like a cone? That's ectasia, a condition that can change vision forever. In this video, we will break down what ectasia is and how it is classified and what actually causes it at the microscopic level. Hello and welcome to Inside Ophthalmology. I am Dr. Amrit, welcoming you to another lecture and today we are talking about the corneal ectasias. So what is corneal ectasia? Let's imagine the cornea normally a strong transparent dome as the roof of a tent. Now imagine that this roof slowly starts to lose its strength. What will happen? It will start to sag, thin out and start to bulge outward. Now that is corneal ectasia. Medically speaking, corneal ectasia refers to an ill-defined, progressive, non-inflammatory thinning and protrusion of the cornea. The exact causes are still a mystery, but what we do know is that there are multiple factors behind this and this weakening leads to irregular astigmatism and blurred vision over time. And in very severe cases, it can cause even rupture of the cornea. Before we dive into the thinning and bulging that define ectasia, let's take a step back into the cornea itself. Because in order to understand why ectasia happens, we first need to understand how the cornea behaves under pressure. Our cornea is made up of six layers, the Bowman's layer, the epithelium, the stroma, the predesmit membrane which is not shown in this diagram, the desmid membrane and the endothelium. And the cornea possesses some of the really important biomechanical properties. In this video, we will explore the key biomechanical properties like elasticity, tensile strength, anisotropy, viscoelasticity and hysteresis and how each one of them play an important role in maintaining the corneal shape and vision stability. And most importantly, we will connect these concepts directly to the pathophysiology of corneal ectasia which is a progressive and vision threatening condition. The first biomechanical property is the corneal elasticity. Imagine your cornea like a trampoline. When pressure pushes it in, say from blinking, rubbing or even surgery or even from the intraocular pressure from inside, it doesn't just collapse on itself and give up. What happens is that the cornea springs back. That bouncing back ability is what we call as the elasticity or more technically the Young's modulus. It's basically a measure of how stiff or resilient a material is. The next biomechanical property is the tensile strength. It is the maximum force that the cornea can withstand before it gets deformed or stretched out. In other words, it is the resistance to being stretched or pulled apart. But where does this strength, this tensile strength and the corneal elasticity actually come from? It basically comes from the tightly woven collagen fibers in the anterior stroma and the Bowman's membranes, membrane. So this is the anterior stroma and here would be your Bowman's membrane. Think of them like a super strong mesh or netting that resist being stretched and help the cornea maintain its natural dome shape structure. Moreover, you should know that there are about 200 plus layers of collagen fibers or the collagen lamellae, 1 to 3 micrometer thick and they are actually stacked together on top of each other parallel to the surface. Let's zoom in further and try to understand the hierarchy of collagen, the key structural protein that gives cornea its strength, clarity and resilience. Let's break it down step by step. Step 1, it all begins with the alpha chains. These are individual polypeptide strands, the building blocks of collagen. Three of these alpha chains will basically twist together around each other to form a triple helix and this triple helix is known as the collagen molecule. This unique configuration gives collagen its tensile strength. The amino peptides could be glycine, proline, hydroxyproline or hydroxylysine. Okay, so that is the collagen molecule or the triple helix. The triple helix is basically a stable molecule. Now, multiple collagen molecules come together, staggered and cross-linked to form what is known as collagen fibrils. And this staggered arrangement again increases the durability. 
So here you can see these are the three amino acid sequences and these are the polypeptides. Now three polypeptides are joining together to form the collagen molecule. The collagen molecules together will bring uh, will come together and get cross-linked to form collagen fibrils. Now step four is these fibrils will bundle together to form what is known as the collagen fiber enhancing the structural integrity. Finally, these fibers are organized into what we saw, the different layers or the lamellae. In the cornea, these layers are stacked and arranged in a highly ordered manner to maintain transparency while resisting the mechanical stress. Right? Here, the main player which is playing an important role in the strength of cornea is the collagen cross-links. Okay? So this is how the molecules are cross-linked to each other like the net. Now, they act like molecular zippers that lock the fibers together, making the cornea even stiffer and even more resilient. So, cross-linked collagen refers actually to the covalent bonds between the collagen fibers, between individual collagen molecules or fibrils and even between the lamellae. So, these bonds will enhance the structural integrity, offer stiffness and resistance to mechanical stress in the cornea. Another important aspect is the arrangement of the collagen lamellae within the cornea. You can see the adjacent lamellae are oriented at 90 degrees to each other. So if first lamellae is like this, the other is arranged like this, right? So this is known as the orthogonally aligned collagen lamellae and this also offers strength, shape and stability to the cornea. So basically the arrangement of collagen fibers, collagen fibers mainly the type 1 or the gonal arrangement and the cross linking between them offers these two biomechanical uh, properties to the cornea. Number one is elasticity and the second one is the tensile strength. Next we have another biomechanical property of the cornea which is anisotropy. Anisotropy refers to the property of a material to exhibit different mechanical behaviors depending upon the direction of the applied force. Now in the cornea this is due to the directional alignment of the collagen fibers. If you can see over here in the central cornea the collagen lamellae are arranged orthogonally as we uh, talked just now that is the layers crisscross at right angles. Now this arrangement provides strength in both horizontal as well as vertical direction. However, at the limbus the collagen is arranged circumferentially. Okay, so at the limbus you have this circumferential arrangement forming a collagen ring that reinforces the peripheral cornea and supports the limbal architecture. So the cornea's anisotropic nature due to these orientation of the collagen lamellae, it provides the mechanical strength, stability and allows the cornea to maintain its dome shape against the intraocular pressure which comes from inside. Now what happens in ectasia? In ectasia, there is a disruption of this normal anisotropic uh, pattern or architecture because of loss of the organized collagen alignment. This reduces the cornea's ability to resist stress in certain direction and that area where the collagen arrangement is lost will be now more susceptible to localized deformation and progressive bulging. So I hope that was clear. That was anisotropy. Next we have is the viscoelastic property of the cornea. The cornea isn't just stiff like a spring. It's actually smart. It behaves in a viscoelastic way, combining elasticity, that is the ability to bounce back, with the viscosity, that is the ability to absorb and dissipate energy. So what makes it possible? We have the collagen fibers. The collagen fibers are going to act like a spring. They stretch and then they snap back. But to prevent damage from long and repeated pressure that comes from blinking, moving the eyeballs, the intraocular pressure within, we need something else. So this is by the proteoglycans and the ground substances present within the cornea. These molecules will slowly absorb and dissipate energy during the prolonged stress and therefore taking care of the chronic stress uh, like a shock absorber. So this is the viscous behavior because of the proteoglycans which are present within the cornea. These proteoglycans are keratocan, lumicin, decorin and mimicin. They basically regulate the spacing between the collagen fibrils and maintain hydration of the corneal stroma and impart the viscoelastic 
biomechanical property to the cornea. The next is the corneal hysteresis. Now, corneal hysteresis is nothing but it's a way in which you can measure the viscoelastic function of the cornea. It's the clinical measurement that captures the combined effect of both viscous and elastic property during deformation and therefore is used as a biomarker for corneal mechanical uh, for corneal biomechanical health. It's defined as a difference in the pressure between the inward and outward applanation of the cornea during an air puff test typically measured using an ocular response analyzer. So as you can see over here in the ocular response analyzer what we do is we uh, expose the cornea to a brief air burst and that brief air puff is going to flatten the cornea. This yellow line indicates the flattening of the cornea. As the cornea flattens at this point we measure the first pressure reading. Now from the flat surface, the cornea now is going to become inward, uh, cornea is going to become concave and then it starts bouncing back because of its elastic nature as it is bouncing back from the concave, uh, from the concavity to the convexity, it is going to again pass through that phase of flattening and that's known as the second applanation and at this point we measure the second pressure reading. The difference between the two applanation events and the difference between the two pressure readings will give us the intraocular pressure. So This is basically out of what uh, out of the context of what we are discussing today but anyhow corneal hysteresis is also an important biomechanical property of the cornea and it actually measures the viscoelastic function of the cornea so now we discussed about the elasticity tensile strength we discussed about the anisotropy viscoelasticity and also the hysteresis and now it's a time to connect all these concepts together to come at the pathophysiology of ectasia. So what really causes corneal ectasia? So this is basically summarized in this table. You can see, let us quickly summarize this. So we have elasticity. Elasticity is the ability of the cornea to return to its original shape after deformation. And loss of elasticity will basically mean that the cornea cannot recover from stress, resulting in permanent shape changes and protrusion. Then we have tensile strength, which is the maximum stress that the cornea can withstand before it tears apart. And lower tensile strength increases the risk of progressive thinning and rupture in severe ectasia. Then we have viscoelastic property. And we know that in ectasia, there will be reduced viscoelasticity, lower corneal hysteresis, which means that the cornea is less able to absorb these shocks, making it more vulnerable to thinning and protrusion. Corneal hysteresis, as I told you, is a marker of biomechanical weakness and usually in ectasia you will have a lower corneal hysteresis. Then we have anisotropy, which is direction dependent mechanical strength of the cornea and in ectasia there will be focal point of weakening that disrupts the corneal di natural directional strength leading to asymmetrical bulging and irregular astigmatism and ectasia. All right, so on this end, we have the biomechanical failures. Apart from the biomechanical failures, also another thing which can happen is that there can be increase in the protease enzyme and decrease in the protease inhibitors. These enzymes are responsible for degradation of the extracellular matrix, the structural scaffold of the cornea. And when that support system breaks down, what we get is stromal thinning and ectasia. On the other side, the environmental triggers like eye rubbing or contact lens overuse can also cause microtrauma to the cornea. This microtrauma will boost the interleukin-1 binding sites on the keratocytes, leading to keratocyte apoptosis and cell death. And again, this is going to contribute to stromal thinning and ectasia. In short, it's a destructive loop where genetic predisposition, environmental factors and stresses all join together, breaking down the corneal integrity from inside out. So as you can see, it can start from a localized area of weakness and later on there can be stress redistribution leading to corneal steepening and thinning and this is known as corneal ectasia. All right. Now let's talk about the classification of corneal ectasia. We have an etiological classification of corneal ectasia in which we divide ectasia into primary and secondary. In primary corneal ectasia, 
we have a developmental problem leading to an inherent weakness in the corneal collagen structure. Then we have the secondary factors like iatrogenic that is post lasic post inflammatory post corneal ulcer or post traumatic reasons which can cause corneal ectasia. The primary corneal ectasias are usually of 4 to 5 types. We have pellucid marginal degeneration as you can see involving mostly the inferior part of the cornea. Then we have terians marginal degeneration. Here you can see in, it involves basically the superior part of the cornea. Then we have keratoglobus which is a global ectasia of the entire cornea. And we have keratoconus where you get a central to paracentral conical protrusion of the cornea. If you look at this, the pellucid marginal degeneration usually involves the lower part of the cornea. The terians marginal degeneration involves the upper part of the cornea. The keratoglobus involves almost the entire corneal surface and keratoconus is central to paracentral. We have another entity which is known as posterior keratoconus and that is associated with Peter's anomaly. The iatrogenic or post-inflammatory, post-traumatic or secondary causes of corneal ectasias could be post-refractive surgery ectasia like LASIK or PRK. We know that in these surgeries, usually a part of stroma is removed or ablated. Since you are removing a part of the stroma or collagen, this is going to lead to a weakening of the collagen, sorry, weakening of the stroma, taking away of the tensile strength of the cornea, affecting the anisotropy affecting the elasticity and therefore it is going to cause bulging and ectasia. Similarly, in post-traumatic ectasia and also we can have post-corneal ulcer ectasia. Next, we have the classification based upon the topographic location. We can have the central ectasia. These are keratoconus and post lasic ectasia. Then we can have peripheral ectasia wherein we have pellucid marginal degeneration and terians marginal degeneration. And we can have a global ectasia wherein the entire cornea can get involved and that is known as keratoglobus. There's actually a way by which you can remember that pellucid marginal degeneration involves the lower part of the cornea and terians marginal degeneration involves the upper part of the cornea usually. Now from terians what I like to remember is the terrace right so we usually have terrace on top of our houses so terians marginal degeneration involves the superior and pellucid marginal degeneration is opposite to that. Okay. So that was about this lecture. In our next lecture, we will be going uh, deep into the keratoconus. So keep watching and don't forget to subscribe to our channel Inside Ophthalmology. Thank you and have a nice day.